they were all just standing there. And I asked them, why aren't you doing anything? Why aren't, why aren't you helping him? They're just standing. So then it dawned on me that actually he, there was no need to put oxygen for somebody who had already passed away, who had already died. Counseling is helpful when people want to go. But if you're forcing it because, you, because people go for counseling after these kind of things have happened. So me, I forced my kids to go. And I can say force because nobody was willing to come with me. People sat there, angry with me, angry with the counselor. We achieved nothing. The media influences uh, how the youth think a lot. And they get affirmation from likes and dislikes from tubes and posts and that kind of thing. How can somebody whom you can't even see influence how your life is? I don't understand. I don't understand. Hi, my name is Jackie Mutere, and I'm also Jerry Vernon Ogola's mother also known as Chichi. Chichi took his own life in August 2019 on the fourth evening at night in my veranda. Suicide is not often talked about very easily um, and especially by parents, but I'm here to tell Chichi's story. I speak because I want to remove the stigma. I want to speak about it as a mental health condition and I speak because I want to honor my son's memory that his life may count for something. I'm a widow and I'm a mother of five children. And I say five, uh, there are now four chron chronologically, but um, in my heart, I still have five children. And I'm a community worker. That's who I am. I am an aspiring politician. And by that, I feel that I can offer myself for leadership as the, the, what they normally say to offer themselves for leadership. I was, um, I'm from Budalangi, but I am married in uh, Siaya, Boro. And uh, that is where my, my, my body will be laid to, laid to rest. Today, we'll, I'll, I'll share with you about what happened to Chichi. Allow me to call him Chichi. That's the, that's the name that, that, that we gave him. And we actually gave him that name because um, uh, after my father passed away, there was uh, there's normally just some money from a pension, a pension benefits uh, that normally comes to the fa uh, to the family, and so uh, in our in our tribe from where I come from, it's called Chisende, and so he was born three days after the money had come out, and so we called his his name is actually Vernon Jerry Chisende Ogola, but now for short form we call him Chichi, so that is how he came. Other people think it's a West African name, it's not. It's very Kenyan. Uh, and so Chichi grew up, um, he was born in 1999, uh, uh, he was the um, third born uh, of my, my children, uh, born in Masaba Hospital. Um, I remember he had a big head, uh, so it was a bit difficult uh, uh, having him, but um, it was a normal delivery, uh, he grew up uh, very normally. And uh, he was a, a vibrant young gentleman and he was very jocular, full of games, full of laughter. And he grew up to be just a, a normal boy. I finished his exams, played football, went for walks, did the normal escapades with, with his friends. Um, until he came to Form 3, Form 4, I started noticing that he was withdrawing. Well, and by, and by withdrawing, I mean he was, um, he was just not the normal chichi that I knew. But I thought this is just his teenagehood and uh, teens behave differently. When children are noisy, at times they become quiet. And maybe when they are quiet, some of them maybe present opposite and um, become noisy. First of all, his grades dropped. There was no excuse for his grades dropping. Um, of course, he'd, he'd be home maybe for one, um, one or two things. Uh, for example, if school fees hasn't been paid, but then when he's at home, I, did, I, I noticed a reluctance to go back to school. It was much, that much more difficult for him to go back to school. And I started wondering what was going on, to, uh, what, what was going on in school. And then one day, he just um, after the holidays, um, he was supposed to go back to school. School's open and he refused. He said he's just not going to go. 
he's not going back to school. And I said, why? He said, he's not going back to that school. I said, okay, there's no problem. So we had to now look, he stayed at home while we looked for another school. And of course, you know, the dynamics of now changing school, that means going back to the old school, getting reference letter, his report form, and, um, and his things. And he just dissociated totally. So we got him into uh, yet another school. And so, but then he came home again, and then he just again refused to go back to school. Then I realized that um, he had also gotten into a crowd of friends, maybe. Um, he was taking, uh, what's it called? Mira. Yeah, he liked taking uh, Mira. And I realized he had gotten some uh, Somali friends, boys from, from the area that he was walking with. Uh, but he would just, he would, it wasn't his, his um, poison of choice, for, for lack of a better word, because his body couldn't manage it. Because I realized after a while he wasn't, he wasn't taking it anymore, because it would dis totally disorient and, and disconnect him. After that, again, he stopped. He said he's just not going back to that school. So now we had to look for yet another school, and now we're in Form 4. And we have to look for another school for him to go to. So, you know, as a parent, and I'm, being a single parent, as I shared, I'm a widow, you would want to give the best for your son so that they are no, you, you, you make up for much more because you're, you know that you're alone and that you just have to fill in the gap so that this child is not left wanting because I don't have a dad. So I said, you, you must get a certificate, whatever it is, you must finish your education. So we got him to the third school. So the third school was a, a bit more flexible, um, understood him, it, it seemed that I understood him. And I think I've, um, he was a, basically a, a shy boy. So I realized he had a girlfriend there. He was, um, because when I'd go there, he'd tell me, oh, mom, meet so and so. It was a mixed school. The setup was mixed, so he was able to, um, to, to mix with other people there and with people with diff with diff uh, from different backgrounds. But then I, again, I realized that now he became very difficult. Previously, he was somebody who was very loving towards me because he knew that uh, he was, for lack of a better word, the man of the house. And he's a, he was a very loving boy. He would come, he would uh, make jokes with me, you know. Uh, I'd call him from his room and my room, we, we were neighbors. Uh, you, uh, so I'd call him and, and uh, I'd call him Chichi. Then from his room, he'd call me Mommy, you know, and uh, very jocular. <clears throat> so I started by calling him and he would refuse to answer. Started um, being very sullen, uh, very angry, and, uh, and he was especially angry with his sister. Um, he, would, he became violent to his sister, his sister that he follows. And when I would defend the sister and tell him that, well, I mean, what is the problem? He would maybe perhaps felt, I'm, I'm, th I'm, I'm also speaking in retrospect, the things that, that I'm thinking about, that he must have felt, I was defending her and not defending him, or maybe siding with her more. And maybe that's what must have made him feel, that maybe he was rejected or that I didn't understand him or that I was um, taking sides with the sister. So he became even more violent with, uh, with her. And then, of course, that means I became harder with him. And so one time uh, we got into a fight um, at home in the sitting room. Um, he started answering her and of course I got into an argument and then I had to intervene. When he saw me intervening, he became even wilder and started beating her. So we all beat him, you know, and they threw him out of the house. And he, 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 he refused to go and I kid you not, he broke everything that was of glass in the house. There was one, one glass cabinet, picture frames, there's a door, you know, the, our doors are, have got grills, metal grills. He held onto that door and he said he's not leaving that house and I've got no right to throw him out. True. He held onto it until that tumor broke. But I had to bring now the caretaker with the two other men to come and help him to take him out so that he would stop beating this girl. And from there, things just went downhill. Where, and he started, he started fluctuating. At times he would um, be very happy. And then at times he would be very sad, very sad. He goes into his room, he doesn't want to talk to anybody. And then I also noticed, um, I also noticed that now his appetite had changed. He's got a very, he had a very vibrant appetite, a very rich appetite. And, and um, if he didn't cook, he would cook. And he would cook rubbish. I mean, I mean he, he didn't know that Ungangano doesn't make ugali. So one day, and he came to, and told me, Mami, Kwanini Ugali is not, what's happening to this ugali? 
What's happening? It's refusing to stick. Why isn't it behaving like yours? I said, which unga is this that you're using? And he says, yeah, I'm using this, the, the, that unga that I found there. I said, just bring that packet I see. It was ungangano. He was making ugali with ungangano because I had delayed to cook. I told him, boy, you have to get yourself oriented into the kitchen. This thing doesn't cook ugali. This cooks chapati. Oh, so now what do I do with this? So what am I going to eat? So when he started changing, I also realized his appetite, he didn't want to eat because he's the sort of person that you eat rice, it has to be a, a bowl of rice. Um, if it is ugali, he has to have a, a proper portion. But then he started missing meals, he started not caring, and then he, doesn't, he didn't care about himself. Um, he started uh, not taking a shower. We'd, after he takes a shower, he'd take a shower after a lot of, um, a lot of uh, coercion. He just didn't care about himself after a while. Then he would go to school and then not come back to school. And, and then not, not come back home. Or, and, and then I, I had to start putting boundaries and perimeters and being extra hard with him, extra serious with him. And perhaps he, must, he might have felt that I was being a bit extra with him. And for example, he's off, of course, because he hangs around with his friends, I tell him, you cannot, my house, you cannot come after 10 o'clock, even if you're a man. You have to, you, we, we've got rules here, we've got other people, don't endanger other people. Come by, by, by 10 o'clock. Make sure that by 10 o'clock you're here because I will lock the gate and I will not open it. So, suddenly, of course, he'd come, I, I just, um, he'd come on time, the initial times, then after a while he'll test your, your patience, come up 10 past, bang the gate until to ensure. I, I was just late, just 10 minutes, I was just down here, I was just down, you didn't hear me, I was calling you. Then now, he, since I've got a balcony, he decided not to go through the official gate and just to be jumping on the balcony. So when people are sitting in the sitting room and they're watching TV, we'd just hear something moving on the veranda. And then he'd knock the door gently. And we'd all freeze because we thought that maybe we'd been vermeered by gangsters. <laughs> I know you're laughing. Boys, you know boys and men do, do, do stuff uh, growing up. And then he just says, don't worry, it's me. Please just open up. You've closed the other door, so now I can't come in. So please just make sure that I... Just, just open for me. And we'd open it. So then the last time when I realized that now he was actually testing my patience and just seeing how far he can go with me, I locked the veranda, the, the veranda balcony door. And he slept on the veranda. Of course, it hurt me deeply that I had to do that, but then what, what else could I do? So he, he, he just slept. Woke up in the morning. The first thing I did was just to open the door for him. He came in. The, he, well, I think he sat there the whole night, uh, or whatever it is. But he came in, and then I had to leave um, to go for work that day, so I left. But uh, things like that, that kind of behavior, um, irrational behavior, um, started becoming the norm with him. And then he started locking himself in his room, in the room. And I tell him, Chichi, you need to go to school. I've paid fees. I'd even taken a bursary. The bursary my my MCA had given me some money for him. You need to do exams. You need a certificate, even if you get a D, whatever it is that you get. But you must go to school. He would sleep for, and so we'd get into altercations and quarrels all the time. And so um, one time I, I became so quite a bit much, and, and until I slapped him, and he left, went downstairs, left, and then um, he came back later. And he was, he just came and he stood in front of me, and he was just crying. He didn't say a word, he didn't say anything, but he was just crying. And I just kept asking me, I asked him, Chichi, why did you? Why did you make me do that? And he didn't talk to me. So this escalated until he started locking himself in his room. But then when exam time came, he agreed to go to school. He'd go to school now. I would now force him. So now he'd bring up all sorts of excuses. I need, uh, I need, to, go to, I need for, to go for football, so I need boots. If you don't give him the boots, it's a quarrel. So you have to come up with the boots. Uh, then he doesn't go and play the football. Then he says, fix my bike. I'm going to be riding to school. Um, uh, and if you don't fix it, I'm not going to school. So you have to fix the bike so that he goes to he goes to to school. So then he rides it for two days, and he tells you that there's a puncture. He's not taking the ride, the bike anymore. So finally, he did his exams, and then uh, of course the exams came out. Uh, he did he didn't do very well, and so that's when he now he really deteriorated. The exams came out when we were up country at home, in the village, and <clears throat> when the results came out, when I showed him, he was sort of. I think it hit him very hard because he was really a smart boy. He actually wanted to do psychology. He'd read psychology books and um, stuff like that, things to do with the mind. He'd like to understand people, how people are thinking. And um, he didn't do very well. He didn't do well, of course. 
And so that is when now the trouble started because now he started locking himself up in his room, not eating, not taking care of himself, not taking a bath. And so I'd keep insisting, come out and come and sit with us, come and eat with us. He wouldn't. He'd rather sit in the corridor when it's dark. I told him, you, don't, you can't sit in the darkness, just come and sit and eat with us. And he wouldn't. He would just sit in the corridor. He one day told me himself, Mami, I need to go for counselling. So they know that they have a problem. They know that there's some, they definitely know that there's something wrong. So I said, you want to go for counselling? What's happening? Do you have girlfriend problems or do you have issues? Is it, is it drugs? Are you taking drugs? Or, or, or um, what, what is the counselling for? He said, me, I just need to go for counselling. I said, okay, fine. Uh, if, if you're serious about it, because I know in previous experience, he, he would ask for things and then not for, follow through or not follow them up or just discard them after a while. He was, not, he was just not serious about it because when I finally told him, do you want, I'm, I'm, I'm organizing for counseling. He says, yeah, I'll let you know um, uh, when we can go. So I actually told him one time that I've, 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 I'm waiting for you to tell me when I can fix the appointment because now I've already organized where we're going to go for counseling. I've organized with a, a, a psychologist. Then he'd ask me, what kind of psychologist is this? Is it a psychologist or Mr. Kimoto Kumisoma Akili? And I said, then what do you think counseling is about? It's about going to just get rid of whatever it is, whatever burden it is, whatever, whatever, whatever burden that you're feeling in your heart. That's what it, it's all about. And nobody's going to read you psychology. Mr. Kimutu Kumisoma Akili said, okay. So I endeavored to, to help him seek. Um, I, I was supporting him enough to realize that um, even when people seek counseling for themselves, it's not because they're weak. It's because they've also identified within themselves that something is really long, wrong, and maybe this is not perhaps the environment that I that I will get the help. That maybe I just need a different because since we've had, we've been in fights, most of them are domestic. He fall, he might have felt that maybe I was just not being fair to him, and he wanted an alternative uh, person to hear him out. And I said that was fair enough with me. That was good enough with me. So he did that. So on that that fateful night, it was a Sunday. And I, I was going to church. And his room is in my room. Remember, we used to call each other neighbor. Um, so we'd reached the stage where he's not talking. You'd speak to him, he'd look at you, but he wouldn't answer. Um, and so I just stood there and I was a bit fed up. I'll tell you the truth. It's, it's quite exhausting to have an unstable person. And by unstable, I mean somebody who's very erratic not mentally stable in terms of somebody who is mad, but you know, you do not know where you stand with this person. You don't know how to treat the former person, the former boy, my former son that I knew. So he, his door was open. He was sleeping with his um, hands straight on the bed. I looked at him just to give him a message that I don't like what you're doing because it looked like he was stretching. He stretched himself out. His legs were straight. His hands were straight like this was in, in his, on his bed. But then, and his Bible was next to him. And my heart skipped a beat. I wanted to say something, but decided we've had too much contention and too much strife. I'm not just going to address it. Let me just go to church. So I went to church and I came back. So in the evening, um, uh, late, late, early evening, we served food and we called him. He didn't want to come out. Um, then my, I told my, my, the small daughter, um, she's a princess. We call her Becky. Becky, so she didn't want, he said, he's refused to come. So I said, okay, fine, then take, his, take him his food, take it to him. So I, she took him his plate of food. So has he, is he eating the food? He said, no, he's just put it there, but he just said, thank you. I said, okay, that is no problem. So we finished, he's just still in his room. We finished supper, We've gone to bed, I'm preparing, I've got my, my pyjamas on. I'm getting ready, I'm thinking in my room. Then my son, who follows Chichi, comes and says, Mommy, come and see what's on the veranda. So me, I was irritated. It's been a hard Sunday. Um, I'm preparing now for getting myself, getting ready for the week. Um, I don't want irritation. It's, now it's about 8.30, nine, nine, going to 9. And he, Mommy, come. First, no, he was, call, he was calling Becky, the small girl. Becky Kujo Wane, she's just playing a bad game. Come and see, there's a game. Just come, come and see. So she refused to go the first time he went and then he came back. 
and said, Becky, come and see. Just come and see what's going on. There's a bad game that Chichi is playing. So Becky's fast. She's a very, um, she's a fast girl. So she said, ah, okay. So then she went and looked and she came back immediately screaming, mommy, come and see this game that Chichi's playing. He's playing and he's swinging on his neck. So I rushed out immediately and I found him. He was hanging on, um, on, the, on the balcony, the, just the front door, not the balcony, but on the front door. It's rafters where they put uh, tanks of water. He was swinging and the first thing when I opened the door, the first thing I saw was his tongue was hanging all the way up to I think somewhere here and it, it was hanging out. And uh, immediately, I, I of course I, I, there was a chair, a table, then he was hanging. So I jumped up immediately. Today, today I don't know how I did that. And I, <clears throat> I removed the rope from his neck and started asking, Chichi, Chichi, and I screamed. So my daughter was in the bathroom, and the other one, I told him, you can come. So I started trying to revive him, and he was foaming in his mouth, and he had tears. But the first thing I noticed was his fingers were gray. And that usually happens when there's no oxygen um, in, in the body after a certain period. And so I started screaming, and I pulled him down, and I, I, I and I was telling them, call an ambulance, call, call the neighbor, bring, call an ambulance. We have to get him to hospital. So when I was pulling him down, I noticed that, well, I, I carried him actually from, the, from where he was, at the table and then the chair and then down. And the way his leg was bent, he did resist. It was at a very funny angle. So I fixed his leg and put him down just, and, and, and I just started reviving him and I wiped the foam from his mouth and I wiped the tears from his eyes. And then I, I told my, my daughters, called an ambulance. So by that time, one of my neighbors, but this little girl, Becky, is very fast. So she went, I think she ran and got, and got the neighbor, one neighbor, and we rushed him to hospital. And when we went to the first hospital, it, um, it didn't have oxygen. So he took him to the second hospital, the hospitals that are in the estate. It also didn't um, have oxygen until we went to the third place. So, they were, and in the car I kept, Chichi, Amka, Chichi talked to me, I slapped him, woke him up. At one point I actually thought he was still alive. I really did believe he was alive. Though something happened to me when I found him up there something happens to your insides, something happens to your stomach, something happens to, you freeze, you freeze inside. The, uh, uh, the doctor started um, first of all checking him. You, of course they have to check if it's somebody who is alive or is dead and if he's alive to give him the, the oxygen. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to stay there and see what was happening. I just couldn't process it at that time. And, and so I came out and I stood on the balcony of the, of the hospital just outside. And I just remember asking God, please help me. Please help me. Please help me. Please help me. I don't, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to think. God, please help me. My mind will burst. Something's going to happen. I'll run mad. God, please help me. Please help my son. Please, God, please help me. So I went back. Inside when I went back, uh, they were all just standing there. And I asked them, why aren't you doing anything? Why aren't, why aren't you helping him? So then it... it after a few minutes, they're just standing. So then it dawned on me that actually he, there was no need to put oxygen for somebody who had already passed away, who had already died. And I, it, it just sunk in my head that Chichi has died. This boy is dead. I, 
I couldn't, I couldn't, be, I couldn't believe it. Things don't happen like that. And I could see when he was sleeping, the way the, the rope that he had used, it had cut inside, it had cut inside his neck all the way. Because I found him hanging like this, and then his tongue was hanging out. <laughs> uh, so now we had to, so I called my family members and they organized for him to be removed. <clears throat> but um, bodies are always removed by police. So we went to Embakasi police station. They went, I, I stayed there. And all this time I'm sitting there, I was just wondering, is this boy really alive? So I'd sit in the reception, then I'd go back and look at him. And, and um, I think the people, when they were carrying him, taking him down to the car, they were dragging him, so he had scraped his toes, so I was trying to clean his toes. I was trying to make him straight, you know, straighten him out, straighten out his hands. I'd go and sit, then come back and sit and look at him and say, I couldn't believe. I'd talk to him and he was still warm, so it takes time for it to, for the body to go cold. So I'd lift up his hand and put his hand on my cheek and ask him why he had to do that. And what was it that was so difficult that we couldn't talk about as a family? <laughs> so, um, eventually the police came. It was about three in the morning, I think. And when they came, they, you know, they put on gloves. I remember being so offended. <laughs> I told him, let me wrap him then, if you can't, if you can't touch him, just let me wrap him myself. So my neighbor who had come with me told me, no, it's okay, mama, just let them do their job. It's just standard procedure. I said, it's okay, let me just wrap him myself if you guys are scared of touching him. I'll carry him if I have to, it's okay. So he... <coughs> So I covered him with the sheet, the hospital sheet. And then after that, they led me out to the car. And then now uh, the cops are the ones who carried him and put him in the back of uh, the police truck, the police Land Rover. So then I left my brothers to take him to the morgue. So uh, that's what happened. And it just ended with Chichi like that. I've never known in my life that I'd be the one to make phone calls to tell people that my son has died. It's not right. It's not right for parents to bury children. The order of things is that children are the ones who bury parents because they've finished their work on earth, not the other way around. And especially not for mental health. So later on, uh, I came back home. Uh, I found my two, my children. They were also, it, it, it paralyzes you. It, it paralyzes you, it paralyzes the family. Because I'm a widow, I, me and my children have just grown up together. We do things together. We consult largely. So having something like this happen to us, it paralyzed us. It paralyzed us. That's all I can say. It paralyzed us. Two days later. But it happened on a Sunday. So Monday, of course, the news has to spread around like wildfire. Then on Tuesday, his friends came. So I was just sitting. That's when I realized that these are... They didn't know what to tell me. I didn't know what to tell them. All I just asked them is that 
you guys knew your friend was this serious and you could never even just come and share with her, share with me. Later on, I apologized to them because I realized I was blaming them for something that they had no control over. So they, that's when they started telling me that even when they used to work with them, he'd, he'd go off, talk about things that were not there, or walk with somebody, they'd meet up with another friend of theirs. He wouldn't greet them, even though the friend would greet him. And then walk a few paces and say, oh, did you just see so-and-so? He just passed. Why, why didn't he talk to me? So we realized that um, he had a, it was a serious mental health issue that, that he was having. Um, or just before, he'd try and explain to me, tell me he wanted something called an aux cable. I don't know what an aux cable is. A-U-X. Me, in my mind, it's aux. O-X. I said, like, what kind of cable is this? He tell, because he wanted to play his music deep into the night. I told me I don't know what an aux cable is. So tell me, explain to me what this aux cable is. So he'd talk to me and tell me, it's a cable that has got one side is, ah, forget it. So he couldn't express himself. He couldn't say what was inside him. He couldn't say what he need. I said, please just tell me what it is that, that, that you want. Tell me what it is. You, you guys are messing up with my mind. You guys are making me think my head is uh, effed up. I said, who, is, who has said that? You guys, you're the ones who are making... I said, please tell me what I have done to make you think or feel that. What, 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 how? Do you eat? Yes, you eat. Do you sleep? Yes. Do I talk to you badly? But that's because we, we're, always, we're always in quarrel mode in this house. We're, we never talk. You don't talk to us. You always just come either demanding, and if you don't fulfill your demands, you get upset. And so, that's when the boys were, the, the boys would tell me that he would behave strangely at times. He would sit, start talking about things that were not relevant. So, They'd either think that um, he's either too high, maybe, or he's taken some medication, or he's on something that them they are, them they are not on, and so they would ignore, and and so they would would just let it go. So then um, that day, I had taken, um, I had asked my neighbor to take a picture of him when he was on the couch, and uh, he, I told him, you see what what your friend looks like. So they passed it amongst themselves. They passed it amongst themselves. So thereafter, none of them could talk. So the first boy was overcome and he left. And they all just followed him. They didn't know how to talk to me, how to, how to, later on they came to tell me that they even went out and they quarreled amongst themselves. Because now they, all of them were blaming each other. Why could you have said something? Why are you coming to tell his mom this now? So they didn't attend any of the meetings until the last day when we were leaving. And after burying him, which was unbelievable. It, it was unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. We came back to Nairobi and we start, now started living the life and now coming to terms with what has actually happened. And so, uh, we keep his clothes in my cupboard. Nobody wanted anything to happen to his clothes. Nobody wanted, I would try and after a short while I went to his cupboard and to clean up his room. But my, my other children, they were so, were so offended. For some reason, they just didn't want anything, anything moved or anything touched. Not to touch his clothes, not to touch. I told them, I'm just cleaning up. So they had to sit, sit there and supervise me. Don't touch Usishike, yo. Don't touch that one. Don't do this to this one. So I realized I'd have to do it when they're out of the house. So eventually one day I did it. So everybody, I washed his clothes, and then every when the, when I had folded them, 
Everybody came and took something from him, of his. My, the daughter took the track suits, the t-shirts, then the other things we just kept, put it, we left them up till today. So I took a, a t-shirt of his and um, and a towel. You know, and I also realized that he had a serious mental health issue. One day, we, just when I used to go to church, we go to church just in the neighborhood. He used to know where I sit in church. He came barefoot and with a towel on his head and just sat next to me. I was so upset. I was so mad. I tried making him sit up straight. I told him to go back home and put on shoes. He refused. So that towel, I've never washed it up till today. I just folded it and the t-shirt that he was wearing. I just kept him so that I can just at least just smell him, just so that I can get, uh, so that I can just get some, just just to be close to him. Because those are the only thing now that remains. I looked at his notebook, his things, his books, just to see if he might have written something. There's a book that he had, and he used to just write down his thoughts. But many of them were of. Um, so artists, songs, and um, people like chronics, uh, reggae artists. Um, then there was, um, when he realized that um, I've come home and I'm tired and I don't want, I just want to relax. There's a certain artist he put on this, I think it's Gramps Morgan, I think one of them. This, there's a song, One in a Million. He'd always put it on for me. And I just, all of a sudden I'm just sitting and I listen to that song. Um, and then they listened to Chronics when Chronics came to Kenya. And then there was um, an artist, and she's a Nigerian singer called Asa, and talks about uh, a mother, something to do with, with a mother, with mama. Now I forget it because I've not put it on for some time. And he just put it on and would listen to it. And so those are things that, um, those are memories that you hold on to. But the real trauma also comes now trying to start to processing the pain. My firstborn daughter is a bit different from me. I'm somebody who's able to talk. She doesn't want anybody to talk about the even her friends. Don't talk about it. Just that the way she is, her character. You know that if you talk about this, you've crossed her, you've crossed her line. There's a perimeter that you, you will not be able, you'll have lost her. So, no, so nobody ever talks to her about it and she doesn't talk to them about it. And also because of the nature of suicide, people can be very insensitive. I remember my neighbors, some neighbors, women came the, just on the last night and said, Hey, mommy, what is the problem? Kwani, what happened? I just used to hear you quarreling. Kumbet is this serious? So I didn't know how to answer them. I don't know whether they'd come to blame me and say that I'd be the cause of, 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 of him uh, committing suicide. And so I dissociated with people. I dissociated with the church. I stopped going to church. I stopped going to meeting people. I stopped going anywhere. I just started getting drunk, sleeping with a bottle, waking up with a bottle. Um, my other daughter had gone to her place so I remained with the two small children because Steph, um, one of the, my other daughter, the one who they used to quarrel with, went back to work. She works in Narok. So what happened is, um, when COVID came, when COVID happened, my daughter's bosses had to leave the country because they are, they are white folks. Mm. It's an institution. So she remained in the house. And when she remained in the house, she, she had alcohol at her exposure. There's a way in which she was mourning in bits and pieces. I didn't realize when she calls me or texts me or tells me something. Then I realized that she, she also became a bit erratic, would want to talk to me, not talk to me, talk to me crying, talk to me telling me, Mommy, I hope you have not done this. I, what are we going to do about Chichi? When are we go? So, but she's the only one. After that December, because he died in August, that December we went home 
and um, we went, the first thing that we did when we arrived, we just went straight to his grave and, fi and, and fixed it. So she told me, she, she, everybody committed to do something on his grave just to feel ownership. Somebody said, I'll, I'll, I'll do the tiles, I'll do this, I'll do that. But somehow, um, the money that what we had budgeted for was not working. So she started blaming herself, thinking that um, it's possible that she wanted to do this, I think, just to maybe absolve herself. Because they used to quarrel before he died. So she started blaming herself. So she started drinking until she was sacked from her place of work. When she came back to Nairobi, she started hanging around with his friends, looked for his friends. I think maybe just want to, wanting to associate or trying to find, just hearing stories about him. And you know, those are boys. She started drinking and uh, going to dens, sitting in mirror spots, being out in the deep in the night, a girl who previously never used to step outside the house, just so that she can connect with his friends and be with him, so that she can be close to the brother through his friends. And to the, she would, and, and to the extent that one time she went to my daughter's house, the big daughter's house, when the big daughter wasn't there, and didn't tell anyone. She just walked out of the house, and I didn't know where she had gone. And I remember that when she had come in, the way she looked at me, I realized this girl is, a, is intoxicated. And then she just disappeared. When I called her, she's not picking up the phone. So me, I raised the alarm with all my sisters, with all my brothers. Call Stephanie. She's not, ta she's not taking my call. So I ran. Something just told me she might be in the neighborhood. And this is curfew time. We're talking 11 o'clock. Do you know I walked alone in that estate looking for her? until I finally found her. And we walked back home. So she also hit depression. I also hit depression. And everybody was managing it in a different way. Um, and you know, you, you want to just finish, you just want to process this thing until it gets out of your system. And you process it and you and you think and you and you, you think to yourself and you talk to yourself. And then one day it dawned on me <clears throat> when the house was upside down. The two small kids are cooking for themselves, are fending for themselves. I realized that there's a problem with, that I had a I had a problem. I personally had a problem and that I had to deal with it. So that is actually when I shook myself out of it and woke up. And people would ask me, Jackie, how are you? Know what's happening to you? I didn't. Nobody would. You would never know because I'd never show it. And so I want to believe that there's so many people who are really hurting out here who never show. And you until you dig deep or prod, or just reach out, just in 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 as just as a comrade and just find out. And people can read you. If you're, if you're being genuine, if you're being fake, somebody will, will, will read you. Because now, because I empathize and I know how people feel, I know when somebody's reaching out to me what they really want to hear. They just want somebody to ask about them. They might not necessarily even have a problem, but they just really want you to care for them. So it seems that they, there's, there's no, people don't have hope, people feel alienated, people feel isolated. And yet they're living in communities and families and you just don't know what they're going through. Others don't, people will not show. Um, and also people feel a need to, to not be a burden to others, maybe. Could be that. But you know, I, I, I want to believe that I'm a bit different. Because I just decided, um, the, you know WhatsApp group, the church WhatsApp group, um, my, my CG, my fellowship, they'd always be announcing, we're having fellowship at so-and-so's house, we're going to so-and-so's house, this is what we're doing, these are the plans. So one day I just wrote, wrote a message and I told them, please forgive me that I just don't feel like engaging and talking to anybody. Nobody in this group has done anything to me, but just the pain that I'm going through, I'm just processing my pain. So please don't take offense. 
and when I don't respond, when I don't ask, when I don't speak, don't, don't, don't feel that anybody has wronged me. It is just me walking my path. And so um, they appreciated. And uh, they came home one day. They decided to have fellowship. And uh, I appreciated that they came for that fellowship. But you know, you, you don't know what to talk because you feel you're being disturbed. Eh? So I appreciated. They prayed for me. They realized that um, I'm 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 not a, I'm not really engaging. But uh, I shared with them also what it was the the pains uh, the, the challenges the family was going through because now I'm not I'm I'm also not talking. I'm also not I'm I'm not, I'm not myself. And then they left. Then COVID happened, and COVID allowed people to be isolated. I sat in my house. And nobody would know what is going on with me. And just go out, get my drink, and come back and sit in the house and, and, and drink. Because I couldn't sleep. I couldn't think. I, could, I couldn't process anything. Any, all, everything that would just come out would just be the pain of this boy. I'd just keep seeing his ha tongue hanging out. I'd keep seeing him in the coffin. I'd keep seeing, I'd, just the entire scene would just keep playing in my mind. And so we had to work through it. And um, one day, uh, I was, there was a youth meeting that was going on. And because one of the pastors who had helped me bury my son knew what had happened, just asked me to come and, and speak during the youth meeting. I said, Pastor, I don't know what I'm going to tell them. He says, don't worry. Uh, God, will, God will give you the words and what you're going to speak. So I thought to myself, Am I, do I want to go into all this techno talk of mental health? Because I realized they were talking about mental health and, and depression, which my son was suffering from. But I said, me, am I, going to, am I going to really start telling them technical stories? I don't even know the technicalities. Me, I just know what I'm feeling as a mother. And um, I just wanted to tell them about the after effects, about the youth... Maybe they, many of them feel isolated, many of them feel rejected, and indeed many go through many stages of rejection. And um, rejection is also part of life, because if you can be rejected from a job, rejected by a spouse, that doesn't mean that you're devalued. You know, you can have a thousand shillings, the note, and crunch it, put it in the soil, put it in water again and put it in the soil. If it doesn't tear, if it dries out, that one thousand shilling is still valuable. It is still valuable. And so I appeal to the youth too, for them to let them know that they are still valuable. You know, you, there is nothing that cannot be talked about because there's nothing new under the sun. I keep saying that. What you're going through is not new to man or mankind. It, can, it really can be solved. It really can be sorted out. It really can be talked about. It really can. And so when I spoke during that youth meeting, um, many of them had, um, came to me afterwards and appreciate that I'd spoken to them. And uh, also, I, 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 the perspective I wanted them to know was the after effect of, you might think that you're ending your problems and end your life and think that you have ended it all, but you have left repercussions with your one action. And it doesn't have to be like that. It's very possible that um, you have hurt your family so deeply, deeper than had you been alive. Um, and um, death does not end the problem but perhaps you've even engineered a deeper problem with, the, with, with, with your family and with the community members around you. And so, as I said in the beginning, that's the reason that I speak. I speak to remove the stigma. I speak so that you remove stigma from parents. I speak so that even if you're going through depression, and now it has been dubbed a mental health issue, it really is a mental health issue. There's nothing, you, 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 you're, it's not written on your face. It's not written on your face. It's, it's nothing that anybody will, will, will pull you out of a crowd. Huh? It is a, a normal process of life. And it, let me tell you that it's a disease just like any. It's just like having malaria, but it is in your head. And I urge you all just to, to reach out and um, to develop the structures. Be able to talk. I realized that he was a very angry boy. Now, these are things that I'm just thinking about and processing in the aftermath. And so they, yeah, there's nothing... Look for a place or look for a platform where you can express yourself. Look for a partner, and by the, an accountability partner, I just mean somebody that you can relate to easily, who is able to understand what you're feeling. 
because it's not necessarily a psychologist. You know, um, there were so many well-meaning people who kept telling me, Jackie, go for counseling. Jackie, go, we'll pay for your counseling. And, and I really appreciate and I thank all my friends who really helped and supported me through that extremely difficult period, especially during the aftermath. And so we went for family counseling. Do you know it was a disaster? That first. Counseling is helpful when people want to go. And when they recognize the need for support for, from an, uh, an alternative person, an alternative source. But if you're forcing it because, you, because people go for counseling after these kind of things have happened. So me, I forced my kids to go. And I can say force because nobody was willing to come with me. But I, I just used my, 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 my parental authority to herd them out and we went. People sat there, angry with me, angry with the counselor. We achieved nothing. We back, went back home. That's when now people started now expressing it. The firstborn daughter, the, the, the two small children. Children will be children. They'll say, Mommy, I can smell Chichi. Mommy, right now Chichi would have done. Mommy, I've just met Chichi's friend. Mommy, th that kind of thing. And the firstborn girl will say, shut up, who's asking you about that? Who asked you about it? Stop talking about him. And the second one will say, eh? What did his friend say? Who, which friend are you talking about? Was it that my tattoo guy? And um, at this stage, really, I want to appreciate um, um, the, informal, the informal working sector, or otherwise the ones that are called Juakali, and these boys on Matatus. Do you know, they were the only, the Matatu, because my son used to like um, taking, what are they called, squad or something like that, on, on the Matatus, the Matatu in our roots. They would, each time I got to the matato, they'd find me standing at the stage when, I, when I'm going to town. They'd, um, they'd always apologize and tell me, Mama, we've heard what you, what happened to you. We've heard, we, and you know, one, one of them said, we have heard what Kijana did to you and we're very sorry about it. And they'd pay my fare to go and pay my fare to come back. And they were so, you know, they were so sorry. And... Others are tactless, and some of the people, the educated people are the ones who are tactless. And the non-educated people, for lack of a better word, are the ones who are so compassionate. Because my, the border guys, I went to the border base and I got on, and the one came to me and said, Mom, and he was totally drunk, and he, he was apologetic and said, Mom, I'm so, I just, I heard something, but is it true? And if it's true, I'm so sorry about it. And you... I, I don't know what you might be going through, Mama, but all I can say is poorly. It shall be well. Things happen in this world. And I, I have really come to appreciate that community where you live. And, but it's also because um, uh, I, had, um, I had aspired to be a member of the county assembly in Imaradaima. So that kind of um, news spreads very fast. And um, there are those, of course, who are spiteful. People are spiteful. People, humans will be humans. Those who will sneer, those will just look at you and wonder what kind of, you know, how you're taking it and look at my, look at my face. And so I put on, uh, because of the medication, I, I ended up taking medication because I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat, and I could not continue being an alcoholic. I went on medication and, uh, of course, it affected my weight. I became very big, extremely big, and I was panting, and it, aff it affected my health quite a bit. And uh, then thereafter, when I started now managing my pain and realizing and coming to terms with what was causing my grief and, and, and my, my change, I, of course, got off the medication and then I slimmed again and then they knew now, now she's really sick. And so, <laughs> it's humanity. People are like that. People are, people are human. People, people, you, and you can't stop people thinking, but you just have to live your life. And uh, the girl who was, who, had, who was working in Narok, uh, on his first anniversary, on his birthday. You know, there's his birthday and then his death day. So on his birthday, we just decided we wanted to... My family were very well-meaning and wanted to have perhaps a service for him. And we, it was during COVID time, so maybe have a service and organize, they'd organize the pastor to come and pray and, um, and that kind of thing. They just said, who, who told you we want that? They just didn't want that. So I bought a packet of balloons. They told me to buy a packet of balloons. 
So we went to the top of our building and um, we released the balloons. And um, we just, wherever they went, we just said we dedicated it to him and the balloons were written, happy birthday. And so one of my daughters wrote on her, I think it was a Twitter account and uh, said, um, today I, I honor my brother and uh, we hope that wherever you're 20, you're 21 today. He died when he was 20, this was a year later. You're 21 today. And I hope you have a blast in heaven wherever you are. We are thinking of you. And then we released the balloons. And so things like that is what is more meaningful than sitting in a counseling session, deciphering your pain and trying to, try, trying to, to, to logicalize your feelings. At times it doesn't make sense. At times you just need to go through the pain first and then thereafter. Coincidentally, uh, recently, uh, one of the girls, the one who had um, turned to drinking, started attending counseling sessions on her own and is doing very well. She kept texting me even during the session, saying, Mommy, I'm feeling so good. I have identified this is the problem and this is what is happening and I'm going to work towards it. And indeed, her drinking is, I can almost say it is, she's dried up. And by drying up, that means she was a very wet, a very wet person. She was imbibing at every corner and she wasn't eating. So she became very thin. Um, we have now come to realize that depression is a major cause of, a, is, a, is a mental health issue. And it's possible that many of the people that we used to think uh, are, are mad, for lack of a better word, uh, and um, that your attempts on your life, they put you in jail, has really not been the way to go about it. Because I, I, maybe somebody should do research about after jailing and attempt, somebody who has attempted suicide, if it has been deterrent or if they actually went on to go and succeed. And, um, and, 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 and finish their lives. But um, it should be something that now should be uh, totally decriminalized because now we have realized it's a mental health issue. That should be the way to go. Uh, and uh, recommending mental assessments for people who go off all of a sudden, there's always an underlying issue. And I think that is one of the ways that um, uh, government, government should go. In particular, I, I, I want to applaud a, a young gentleman who comes from Bomet. Who, um, an A student in university with the first class, first class honors. And I, he sent me his transcript. He's an A student, but wanted to end his life because he felt that there was nothing, he was no hope. There was no hope. There was nothing to live for. He finished his school, gotten good results, sitting in the village and he's not even the chairman of a cattle dip. He can't do anything with his degree, can't do anything with his life. He said there was nothing, he's, he's a, he's a, he's, he's, his mother is a widow, his, his dad died when he was young, so he's been brought up by his siblings. And the mother is diabetic because of all the problems, and so now the, it's a situation in the home. So he decided instead of me being a, con, a constant um, burden, I can't get work to help my mother, I can't get work to help my family, what am I living here for? Let me finish it. I have cancelled people until I... Well, I, I don't really go there with any te techno knowledge, but really just to share share my story and just to help them understand that it's not only you, there's nothing new under the sun, and that you can get support and help for whatever it is that you're going through. You know, when you've reached the edge and you're about to do something, it's going to be so final, and it's going to have repercussions like I've shared with you. You don't need to do that to your parents or to your siblings and friends. Just turn around. Just turn around and stand and think about it and look for help because help is available. You know, I, I keep trying to tell them that you're not an accident. There are people who have died, there are women who have tried giving birth, having, conceiving they don't have children, there are men who shoot blanks, there are, there, are, there are women who can't give birth for physical complications, but you have reached here, you're 20 plus. How can God not want you to do something for your life? Yeah, connect with him. I always urge them to connect with the person who created you. Each manufacturer has got a manual. And each manufacturer had something in mind. So you go back to your manufacturer and connect with him and he'll, find, and, and he'll tell you what it is that you need to do with your life. I don't have the solutions. And to parents, I just beg your patience. I just beg your patience. During that time, after the clip went viral and uh, my cousins, relatives, friends started calling me, um, uh, they... they they are going through a lot of stuff. Many of them have paid schools, jump, children who are jumping schools. You think that they'll work in this school, it, will, it doesn't happen, you take them to another school. 
Just go through the process. It will give you peace knowing that you, full, you fulfilled that you played your part in trying to support this boy, this girl, in, um, in, 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 get, in, in living a comfortable, in creating an environment for them to, thri to thrive and for them to flourish. Just do your part. Be a parent. And I know you might, um, you might be scared even to rebuke, thinking that he's going to do something so drastic. Some, some, some kids and some teens I know have actually threatened, I'm going to do harm to myself, you know, try to manipulate a parent. But... Um, it doesn't harm also to reach out to somebody who you think can be helpful to you. Uh, if it's a clinical uh, counseling psychologist, if it is um, the, the church, if that's what you believe in, if it is a friend who can help you just walk with you, because it, it cannot be easy. Some of it, as I've shared with you, it can just be the psyche of a person. My son was a very happy boy, but he was a very sensitive boy. And uh, it's possible that maybe just the, the, the domestic situation must have influenced him somehow and maybe somebody somewhere did something that made him sudden thinking that he was rejected and that he didn't matter. Because remember I shared with you at uh, there are times when you tell me, oh, Mommy, I can't live like this. I can't live like this. Miss Wezi Shifi, I can't live like this. And I say, why can't you live? I mean, so how do you want us to live? And he just say, I can't live like this. So maybe by the time he was reaching that point and seeing that he, He's got no, no, nowhere to turn to. He can't turn to the left. He can't to turn to the right. There's no, there's no solution either side. I simply can't live like this. Let me just finish it all. So there, and then there are people with different psyches. There are others who have actually just got trauma. There are others who I believe, and I, I say this with a lot of caution, who feel entitled and feel that if they're denied a small little thing that they're just going to you know, get back at society, get back at their families, get back at their parents and, and do this just to them. There are others who are under the influence um, of uh, drugs and na narcotics and um, influence their thinking because that has happened also before. I've, 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 I've talked to parents who have also shared their, their um, things that happened to them so, so much. And then there's, allow me to share this story of a, of a dear lady friend I've made a lot of friends because of my son, and that is why I keep telling you I speak just to give this, um, 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 to honor his, his memory, because it has made me be able to reach out to other parents. There's a lady in South Africa, her 17-year-old son, climb, a very helpful boy, a helpful, wonderful boy, and she had named him In God I Trust, a wonderful name. Uh, just committed suicide, climbed on a stool on a ladder and committed suicide. And this young mother couldn't come to terms with the pain and just felt the pain and just would reach out to me. And so she said she just wanted to walk the path of her son's pain so that she could identify with whatever it was that he must have been feeling internally so that it would also eventually give her closer, closure. So she climbed on a stool, put the rope up where she found the rope, and put her head inside and actually wanted to start strangling herself. But then when she reached that stage, she just started, she broke down and started crying and um, asking God and, uh, you know, and um, I, trying to identify with the pain her son must have felt during just that last moment and what it is that must have led him to, 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 um, to go to that stage until he, he hung himself. And I've also noticed that a lot of Children from single mothers are the ones who feel inclined to protect their parents or to protect their mothers, or to protect their mothers from pain, to protect their mothers from whatever they think they believe the world is um, doing to them. So they want to be part of the solution. And perhaps their thinking is that their solution is to finish it so that he becomes less of a problem, so that she has less problems to deal with um, if he's out of the picture. I've, I've noticed that, and with, especially with the parents that I've interacted with, a few boys, parents, um, parents of boys have called me, but for them it's more that, um, why couldn't my son come to me? But I can't answer those questions. If the police and the National Crime Research could actually tell you about the number of corpses that go to the mortuary, because of suicide, the youth, it would be pandemic level. It would be pandemic level. So if there are any interventions for the youth, let the youth engage with processes that are available for them to get and seek support. Likewise, the parents, and, like, and, and for communities to stop stigmatizing suicide. Because, you know, you think 
long time ago it would be somebody either who took the easy way out or you'd be told that somebody was so selfish until they they decided they're going to to kill themselves it was a selfish deci- decision it could have been selfish to the extent that they did not want to be a burden to you and they are th- they are thinking of themselves yes indeed they're thinking of themselves to finish the problems potential potential problems that they represent on this earth and so will just remove themselves and uh, also perhaps um different social influence the media influences uh, how the youth think a lot and they get affirmation from likes and dislikes from tubes and posts and that kind of thing how can somebody whom you can't even see influence how your life is i don't understand i don't understand huh because you surely you don't see somebody somebody has just written something you don't even know the state of that person it's on on it's an ethereal it's in fact it's a myth words have come out and you want to take those words to heart and think that the, that is what you are why should um a vision or words influence what you should be or or define who you are as a person we need to also develop mental resilience and be such as this there's somebody called the creator if you believe in god i call him god who created you for a purpose and a plan who is not an idiot and he do who does not do things by accident he does things by design you were designed to live here and to add value to your life to your family to your to to your community and to your country please seek for it and find it so i'm inspired by first of all by the fact that god affirmed to me that i'm not a mistake and that i'm here by design um secondly it's also the women that I work I uh, I have a CBO it's called Grace Agenda that supports um women uh who were violated who were raped during the 2007-2008 post selection violence who got children from the violations and whom government has never acknowledged or responded or supported and so we've um many of our efforts have just been about highlighting um the consequences of gbv and the, the consequences of violence during election and consequences of violence in our communities and violence against women uh, specifically and so i'm seeing the current environment leading towards the same thing because there's a lot of bile there's a lot of um hostilities and uh, uh, tension and political tension and it seems that the violence and what happened to us during that time people have not learned the lesson and by that i also want to speak to um the ibc the body that takes care of elections in, in in this country how is it that that officer when the men that were carrying her off were actually threatening verbally sexual assault on the woman and they did nothing about it at that time to the police what were the police doing who were supposed to be guarding her because that's the work of the administration police what were they doing so it it begs the question if at this at um at by election level this is what we are going to see what will happen when it's at national level and there are elections everywhere and what country are we looking towards if this is going to be the consequences of just choosing a leader <music>